Welcome to the Hospitality Maverick podcast show with me, Michael Tinkster. We are on a mission to share what Maverick leaders know and do to build businesses that deliver strong results and positive impact on people, society, and the planet. Thank you to our brand partner, BizSimply, for sponsoring this episode. BizSimply is the all-in-one workforce management software that enables your business to become more efficient and profitable. The software designed and built by hospitality experts to enhance the way shift-oriented operators manage their business, optimize their entire people journey, and making every shift run like clockwork. And we join forces to help the industry to find new ways to become even more innovative in how we lead our people, how we operate, how we grow, and how we serve our customers. Together, we wanted to share strategies and tools to make the industry thrive long-term. It's a process of continual improvement, which I think sometimes we're very bad at understanding is there's not really an end to it. It's a long journey and a journey you can be on for life. It's not geared up in a way. It's not like you reach this point and you get a gold star. It's it's very broad. It's very open. They're open to interpretation. That's good as well. Like one university, will be, for example, goes one way and another goes the other and they completely disagree with each other, but they're both following the same principles. Uh, so I think it's taking a little bit first and trying it out, see if it works, uh, but involving lots of people and just talking about it. This is Matt Tippett. He is the head of bars and dining at the University of Reading. And it was super interesting to get an operator on the show that runs University Catering. And you might ask why? Because as you will learn, it's a complex operation to run. And even more so, when you decide that your food offering should be delivered in accordance with the Menus of Change framework, which is a groundbreaking initiative from the Culinary Institute of America and Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. And we will be diving into some interesting subjects like how do we actually run a food service offering in a university campus? And what is the menu of change and how it's incorporated into their food philosophy and what they have learned about implementing the principles from the menu of change framework. We also talk about how they actually create balance between providing healthy and affordable meal options for students and campus staff. This conversation will blow your mind when it comes to what's possible for you to do when you implement some solid principles around how you want to operate as an operator that both puts people, food, community, and the planet first. If you liked today's episode, it will mean the world to me if you can leave a review on the show on either our website, Apple Podcasts, Spotify. And as you know, the better the reviews, the better the guests, and ultimately, the better the learning is for you. Now, dear Maverick, run! Grab that notebook and pen. You can learn a lot from this conversation, how you can make your business more impactful. Enjoy. Today's journey and conversation will be a bit different than what we have had before because uh, we're going to be talking with a university and we're going to dive into their food service as well and their unique approach to food and menus and uh, i've talked a bit about it before here on the show the the menus of change uh which comes out of harvard and we're going to touch on that again today and it's not an easy toll to follow that i can tell you so with that said welcome to the uh, show matt it's a great pleasure to have you here absolutely amazing to be here and to uh, guide everyone through menus of change and what we do yeah, because I'm sure there's people out there that have seen it, but then how do you actually practice this and how do you actually do it? I think that's been one of the big questions I've asked myself and also been trying to practice this in a in a in a office meal business in London before the pandemic. We really learned there were some things that is quite difficult when you want to do the right thing. But enough of that. Um let us hear a bit more about your background, Matt, and also what your role is uh, within the University of Reading? Uh, so my background, believe it or not, is I have a degree in geography. So obviously, naturally, you 
choose food service to go into. Uh, it was a sort of by accident uh, I ended up in food service. Uh, I've spent more of my time managing bars than food and um, I think the best way of describing why I manage our catering is that I used to um, tell my boss that I could do a better job uh, than uh, my previous colleagues. So here today I'm trying to uh, make it the best uh, university food experience in the world. We're very modest. Well, uh, when you put your neck out, sometimes you have to be careful because you get what you ask for. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Hundred <laughs> percent. Been given that. Can you tell a bit about your, you know, your vision and your philosophy around food at uh, the university and uh, and how exactly all this came about? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the University of Reading is a really interesting university. It's a uh, Red Brick University, it was born out of Oxford. Uh, we have a huge amount of uh, expertise on campus in and around, uh, we call it agri-food. So we do agriculture, soil science, uh, nutrition, food science. Uh, we have this fascinating um, pilot plant where we uh, can miniaturize processes on an, from sort of industry. Uh, we have our own farms. Uh, the university helped look after National Fruit Collection in Kent with DEFRA. Uh, so that, that it's fascinating. There's so many people working in and around food. And then we have industry, so there's Mondelez on campus. Um, and there's lots of other fun and exciting businesses um, working alongside our academics. So we have all of this activity going on around food. Uh, so we wanted our food service to match that ambition, drive, um, sort of looking towards the future to fix the world's problems of both today and tomorrow um, through research. So we had a long look at, um, one of my first jobs was looking at what we're doing, why we're doing it, should we continue doing it? So we had a look around the UK and then we looked wider. Uh, we saw uh, food college and university food service in the US. Um, when you look at that, there's some really fascinating models um, and sort of top, absolutely amazing hospitality operations um, across multiple universities, so Harvard, UCLA, uh, University of Massachusetts, uh, Amherst. There's lots of fascinating examples, more than you could uh, read out on a list. Um, we started looking at what they were doing and how they were doing it, and then we came across menus of change. And I remember speaking to my uh, counterpart at the University of Colorado Boulder and I was like what is all this about is it greenwashing is it what what, what, what is menus of change and he went, no it's where it's worse than that he said it ends up being religion uh, he said you <laughs> breathe it eat it and he said then you have separate groups going off in separate directions going no it doesn't mean that it means this so he said then they split uh, but he said the overall thing is everyone's traveling in the same direction and you have uh, 24 principles that are very broad um, and they, they guide your operation. Uh, so we, we brought those principles back and um, started looking at what we wanted to do. And by um, sort of happy coincidence, uh, probably because we did so much food on campus, sort of research teaching, uh, we had a very large catering presence compared to the size of our university. More, there was more catering going on than you'd probably expect. Um, we had a lot, large number of catered students, so these are students that were fed as part of their uh, living in halls accommodation. We had always offered a much more flexible experience with living in halls than most universities would. So our students, or well, sorry, the, what normally happens is you eat where you live. So you live in a building and you have to eat there like two, three times a day, maybe five days a week, maybe seven. Varies from campus to campus. We've always taken, well, we've taken the approach for at least 15 years that allows students to travel around campus and eat um, where they are. Very novel experience, very customer friendly. Um, so we've been, um, we, we saw in the US that this model was called meal plans and we're like, oh, we like that. We like the flexibility. We like food being a force for good. Uh, like you feed students better, they do better. So very much like we've learned in schools and hospitals and athletes so then we really had a hard look at ourselves and what were we doing and we realized the biggest thing we weren't doing was cooking um, we had a lot of food but it was mainly coming out of packets and um, maybe it was quite sort of sterile uh, so we 
and our first part of the journey was really rebuilding that uh, cooking expertise uh, and driving towards cooking from scratch. So today we cook the vast majority of our food from scratch. There's a few exceptions like bread and some ham, for example. They, those are sort of the, the areas where we don't cook it. But say cooking sauces, we don't use. Um, we use stock bases and then it's sort of like cooking from at home, really, if you're doing it properly. So we today cook probably around 5,000 meals to a day on average. It varies heavily according to the time of the year. Uh, but it's a lot more passion about food. Uh, this morning I got shown a focaccia, which they've been cooking. And you're just like, it's just really nice to see, see people cooking. And they're cooking on a budget, which I think is also really fascinating. So we use free range pork and we are baking for focaccia and all of those things. And we're doing it on relatively small amount of money, uh, which I think can inspire others and restaurants to sort of copy parts of what we do and other universities that you can make it work. What do you think make you guys stand out compared to, let's say, just stay in the UK, because it seems like you've been to the US and there was lots of inspiration, but what makes you stand out compared to other universities, food service, besides, you know, scratch cooking, I guess that's, that, that's a big one. Yeah, I think it's the complete refusal to follow what other people are doing. Um, we had some history on that with our bars, which I previously managed. Um, where we're like, oh, people say you have to serve this and that, and you have to do things that way. And we're like, oh, we just don't want to do it that way. We want to do it the opposite way. So say with bars, people are always like, you have to have one brand, this type of brand, then that type of brand, then that type of brand. And we're like, no, we want to rotate everything all the time on our bitter taps. And they're like, you can't do that. It's like, why not? Well, because it's not how things are done. And I think very much um, university food service at times can be a bit like, that's not how you do things. And we're like, well, we are going to do it this way. We're going to cook from scratch and we're going to put our money into stuff, cook using basic ingredients. And we believe we can make everything stack up that way around. Um, and again, because we use meat so sparingly, we can buy really good quality meat. So um, some of my colleagues will choke when they, you say to them, yeah, we're just using organic pork. They're like, well, even for breakfast? Even for breakfast, it's fine. You can make it work. Yeah. And part of it's accepting that you can't use certain ingredients. So, for example, we accept that we can't use chicken from Thailand. So then that product doesn't exist. So when you're costing recipes and menus, it, it's not there. Um, you have to be more creative with less meat and you use it sparingly and with care. And it's a precious resource rather than just something you can just throw thousands of turkey twizzlers out at the uh, students. Um, it's also reflected that some of our food is coming from our own farm. So we have a sort of take the whole animal approach. Um, with many many types of meat what what do you think uh, like you know if you should share that journey where you actually go from where most food service operation is and in, in, in even if you think about just catering or restaurant is that they have centralized production where sources and so on and you then did the opposite um, and i guess you have some of the same challenges around skills and chefs in the kitchen how did you manage that journey? Because I think there'll be somebody say sits out there and listens to say, yeah, that's all good, but you know, cooking from scratch, but we don't have the, the labor to do that. I think it's again how you approach the issue. Um we had a cent we had centralized production and we scrapped it. Um which was quite quite brave, I suppose. Um and the biggest thing the biggest reason why we scrapped it was because we felt there wasn't um the love of creating a dish didn't necessarily wasn't wasn't was quite a long way away from the customer, and there was a big disconnect. Uh, it was very much based on um, producing fewer menu items and the same menu items being in multiple places at the same time. And because of our population, it's not like I say a high street restaurant where you might have a set menu and you can run on that every single day, or have less variety. We have to change our menus each day. Um, and we can't run on a two-week cycle because you have menu fatigue. So we that's the reason we got rid of centralised production. And then in terms of skill, we were like, so what type of people do you want serving your customers? How are we going to build a business? Um, 
so recruiting chefs is incredibly challenging. Um, but equally, you start to find ways of dealing with that. So it might be through better technology. So you have a chef. So how are you going to use that chef to the best of their potential? Uh, so, for example, we're looking at rationale, vario pans, because I can help speed up the process. Um, but in terms of like absolute labor, like we've got apprenticeships starting on site. So we're like, well, the best way is to create your own supply of labor. So we're like, right, we'll, we'll, we'll start doing that. Um, I don't know, it's a bit of a loaded question. It's very hard to, uh, I don't think there's one thing. I think it's about being a great place to work. Sort of trying to build your own supply of chefs, training, variety. One of the most interesting um, parts of our recruitment has been that when you say to chefs, we change the menu each day. They're like, oh, this is amazing. So we've had some really good chefs coming from very good restaurants, uh, often with Michelin stars and things like that. And they're like, no, we're quite happy coming to the university. You're like, really? And they're like, yep, want to cook something different each day, want variety, want to cook from scratch, um, want a sort of supportive environment. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's interesting. So we've got a lot of interesting chefs coming f from interesting places. What we try and avoid is doing like proper interviews, as in we sit someone in a room and like chefs don't live in that environment. We put chefs in kitchens and interview them by cooking food with them and chatting to them and seeing if they want to be part of our journey and try making, making sure it's a two-way interview. They need to interview us as much as we interview them. Um, so yeah, that's probably our, maybe our success. But I think um, we were very lucky that we cooked all the way through the pandemic. So we never stopped. Uh, we have residential students, so we... Uh, legacy of the pandemic is that we cook 365 days a year now uh, without fail and we did that through the pandemic we I think we we stopped for Christmas just before the pandemic and haven't stopped cooking since uh, and uh, slowly as we got through the pandemic the government started to get the hang of the fact there might be students in halls of residence so uh, the legislation became a bit easier to comply with uh, but we got there and fed everyone food safely uh, without the use of pot noodles and um, lots of other things that were happening. So as a university, we came out of the pandemic reasonably well in terms of food, with no huge complaints or shocking media stories of little portions of cheese being delivered to people's room, rooms and various other awful things that you heard. Uh, so, yeah. So so just to also put it in the context of scratch cooking, because there's probably people like when I heard it the first time, so I was scratched my head a bit. So how long have you been scratch cooking? How, how long is this, you know, since you implemented it? And how, how, was the, how long did it actually take that change process over time to really to get to the level you are at today? So the process is still happening um, because we also could never stop. So as we spoke about we cook every single day and we have students every single day and staff so we continue across multiple sites uh, so we are probably about 80 percent of the way there uh, we've got some big areas still to do like we'd like to bring bakery um, in-house like bread baking uh, that's that's the big the big scary one we need the expertise um, but it's, I think it was always about taking, picking one area at a time and working through it. So say one summer we picked off curries. Uh, I had a look at curries, right? How are we going to scratch cook curries? Uh, we have a quite an interesting business profile where we're basically busy when everyone else is quiet. And then we're really quiet when everyone else is busy. So we have these huge peaks and troughs. So we also had to look at how do we scratch cook with those peaks and troughs. So for example, curry pastes. We make a lot of curry pastes in our vacation periods and freeze them um, and then use them when we need them um, and then do a lot of things like that where we can start a process and it freezes with no um, huge quality problems uh, or pickling or making jam, all, all of those techniques, uh, then we'll do it and um, yeah. Like cookies is another one. We we seem to this university seems to run on cookies at the moment. So we make cookie logs, as our staff call them, which are just long uh, dough sausages, and then you just chop them up when you need them. And 
but they, these are all techniques that you can use to help make it a little bit more manageable. So the freezer, the freezer is actually a big, big part of how you prepare for your 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 high volume times. Yeah, I mean we can go from our peak to trough is like nine. I mean, our quiet time is probably 1% of our full capacity. So in terms of um, stopping and starting, it's pretty, we have these the other three terms and really ramp up very quickly. So you can go from very low numbers to almost full capacity in a day, uh, two days. Uh, so it's, it's, <laughs> it's really interesting. But yes, a freezer, jam, pickling, there's loads of great techniques out there that all count towards scratch cooking. You can use them. Um, we're not, um, as I said, we do run on a relatively small amount of money per head, per meal. So we have to be creative and look at how we can use different products. But it's all homemade, which is the big, big sort of central ethos of scratch cooking in my mind is it's homemade. And we know where it's come from and where those ingredients are sourced from. When you say budget as well, uh, how, how do you do that? You said you talked about you reduced, of course, meat is one thing, you know, less but better meat. But but what, what else do you do to actually hit that budget? Because people say it's impossible. And I, I think there's coming up a big, big thing around, you know, school food, public school food, where the catering companies are now saying it's not possible for, for the budget to do this food anymore. But it's quite interesting. I'm not saying they shouldn't have more money, but it's quite interesting if you understand how to use ingredients and how to combine them, how you actually can optimize your budget a lot. I don't know. It would be interesting to hear what you did beside reducing meat. Um, well, as we reduced meat, uh, the big one was we also sourced from our own farms, which was a fairly um, interesting uh, experience to go through. So we have a large amount of um, farms and part of that we have uh, some dairy cattle and also some beef cattle and um, we're like right how do we get these to our dining rooms uh, so we take the whole animal goes to the butcher and we decide how to butcher it which then taught us and our chefs how to utilize every piece of that animal so today with say beef we use everything that we're legally allowed to use other than bones, we we can't can't make can't make beef. We, we we don't need the amount of beef stock that we could make. Um, but I think that whole process teaches you about cheaper cuts, different cuts, like how to utilize uh, different types of meat, which is also very helpful. And we do the same with um, pork. So our organic pork comes from a single farm, and then we choose how we're going to butcher. The animal and the commitment to take an entire animal from um, from a farm, so you take the pork, uh, means that we can afford meat that we wouldn't necessarily normally be able to afford. So then now that farmer knows he's getting a good price, so we buy it direct from him. Our butcher then butchers it to how we want. We pay the butcher, and it comes back to us. Uh, so it's quite a novel, a novel approach, and it means everyone wins hopefully through the supply chain. In terms of like managing cost, it's also other things that like we look at educating students, like how much do you want? Do you really need to put that much on your plate in one go? Like if you just put that in the bin, you're ultimately paying for that. So take a little, come back for some more. So most of our dining rooms operate on a help yourself, like all you can eat, but we encourage people to take less and come back for more if they want want more looking at foods that fill you up so pulses and legumes are a fun fun area um, teaching students about protein like this is a good source of protein like they all believe that chicken is the only source of protein um, so i think it's 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 a lot of little things going on in the background rather than one one big sort of way forward um, i would say this year has been very hard <laughs> Uh, the hardest year in terms of balancing costs when you see some of the pr price rises coming through. But equally, I think even when you see a 60% say cost increase come through, if you know you're using ingredients, you know those... So the in ingredients often cost a lot less than their pre-made item. Um, so your bag of flour that was a pound that's say now £1.20, yes, that's a big increase that's gone through. But in absolute terms, it's still 
still relatively cheap than compared to its sort of fully made like multi-portion lasagna so we've been I'd say that does help as well it's I hope hopefully people can understand what what, what I'm what I'm getting at there but um I think, yeah, trading and using ingredients is a much better place to be at the moment because you're, in cash terms, you're a little bit safer. I guess also you have the flexibility because you are changing all the time that you can actually adapt that way. You're not fixed on that menu you promised that goes in a circulation every two weeks or three weeks or whatever it is. Absolutely. I mean, I remember one of our green grocers telling us we've got so much celeriac. Uh, this was towards the end of the pandemic. They're like, we've got Solaria coming out of our ears because all the restaurants that use it aren't open. Um, so we lived on Solaria for quite a while uh, when we got offered a, a pallet of Solaria. Um, so, yeah, I mean, being flexible and open to uh, in- gluts of ingredients or last minute ingredients does open up um, a lot of avenues that you don't normally expect. Uh, we've started chatting to the NFU, for example, about local producers to try and expand uh, our local supply chain so where we know there's people producing food locally, uh, even if it's only for a short window, uh, be, being there and able to take it, uh, say, fruit in over the summer. So we're traditionally very quiet in August, um, which is a busy month for fruit, is, say, preserving it, pickling it, jamming it, all, all good ways to take a low cost ingredient seasonal ingredient and keeping it for the winter uh, I think yeah seasonality is always something that's missed um, I think so many people just forget about it we'll go oh, I've put seasonal veg on the menu and you're like is it still peas and broccoli so uh, yeah I think and uh, getting beyond the fruit and veg that we uh, there's not many uh, there's not much f- fruit and veg that we really use I think when you look at it when you look at us as a country right, there's so much variety and there's so many different grains and that it's just expand diversify um, like millet is a really exciting um, grain um, it's the UN grain of the year I believe at the moment um, yeah it is yeah yeah absolutely fascinating um, and being adventurous uh, like we've been looking at uh, beans uh, we, we love a bean at the University of Reading uh, we do a lot of research into uh, broad beans and fava beans and uh, we've been looking at better quality beans and our procurement guy was like oh I found better quality beans so like giant chickpeas and uh, really interesting and exciting great for salad bars and maybe uses where you're eating it as just a chickpea or a uh, kidney bean is I think it goes back to uh, putting the right food in the right place so your small little chickpeas might be great in a curry but if you want to put it on a salad bar using a different product um, and being a bit more adventurous it goes back to being adventurous I suppose with your with your fruit and veg to avoid the use of meat so we have meat but we don't want to use a lot of it so let's find more exciting fruit and veg for everyone to eat in another project I'm involved, uh, we, we often talk about how to make greens for your food and how to make it delicious and how actually to use cabbage because there's so much advantages in using cabbage because it's available most of the year and actually it can be really tasty if you know how to use it. And actually people actually like it even though they said, I don't like cabbage, I'm not going to eat cabbage. And then they taste it if you have made it into the right slaw or just put the right umami flavors in, use miso paste or whatever you do, very small, small things that can make this, you know, you know, loved and hate vegetables really, really critical because also it's full of fiber, again, from a nutrients point of view. So I think there's so many interesting things you can think about when you do your menu and actually use vegetables. You think, oh, the customer is not going to like that. But that depends on how you prepare it and what taste profile you give it. The um, One of the great things that came out of Menus of Change is the Edgy Veggies Toolkit. And it's a, it's a piece of research. And it was like, how do we get people to eat more vegetables? Uh, it's not leading on health. Well, health was discovered to be one of the worst things you can talk about with vegetables. Which makes sense because my three-year-old will, definitely doesn't respond to uh, healthy eating. Um, but making them exciting and uh, talking about the taste or where they've come from, all successful uh, strategies to sell more fruit and veg. 
Uh, so the Edgy Veggies Toolkit is a, works for any operator and you can log in and have a look at, play around with vegetable names and it comes up with lots of good suggestions like zingy carrots and they're like, these are all scientifically proven strategies to sell more fruit and veg on any menu. Uh, but it's just sensible. We've taken it a step further by doing a piece of research around oily fish. So some of our academic research pointed towards the fact that uh, teenage girls in particular are lacking iodine in their diets. And iodine's a super important mineral for brain development. And the two sources of iodine are oily fish and uh, cow's milk. So we're like, okay, which, which, which one are we going to aim at? Let's go for oily fish. So we had things like um, smoky carbonara, which was uh, smoked mackerel carbonara. Uh, Thai style fish cakes, like with a crunchy glaze. Uh, it's all of those sort of strategies which then enticed people to take those products. So we ran a, um, we, we offered those items in dining rooms with no additional labelling. It's just like this is a Thai fish cake. This is uh, carbonara, fish carbonara, and then we ran it again with sort of the taste led labelling, and there was a large increase in the amount people took and these are in areas where people are not paying for those individual dishes so literally they've got no price concern they're just walking along counters going i'll take some of that take some of that take some of that and people are just walking past uh fish carbonara and uh, fish cakes but as soon as you put some taste labeling out oh that sounds nice take some of that uh, so it's, it's interesting um interesting that it works in that area as well and uh, we're hoping to trial it across more universities to see if our pilot study um, reflects um, more more groups of students and staff. Uh, and then again, that then that knowledge can be pushed into industry as uh, examples of things to do with less popular fish. Yeah, and it's so interesting as well, like for often when you, you think about it, you have these health claims would make people pick something up. It's not because we as humans are ingrained with, we are seeking taste and pleasure so it's, it's so obvious when you say that and it's so genius anyway that actually you then maybe also can control especially when you have a buffet situation you want people to eat not just one thing you want them to eat multiple things and get the reduce the food waste and it's so interesting that you've seen this early signs of that really make people also try maybe things they wouldn't normally try like smoked mackerel or sardines is another one where if you said oh you you want sardines people said no 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 way i don't want sardines but if they don't know it's in there and they taste it and it's prepared in the right way again it's uh it's like sometimes you would say wow this is just absolutely amazing absolutely i mean our, our we have a gluten-free vegan chocolate brownie which again with some of our psychologists on campus i can said i can guarantee if i label it vegan gluten-free barely anything will get taken so we put out put out vegan gluten-free chocolate brownie which is delicious and it barely gets touched and then you just call it brownie suitable for vegans and those following a gluten-free diet 20 times as much goes out the door you're, you're like well those are two words we probably should never use on products as a leading headline and then when you upgrade the label again and say this is a delicious indulgent chocolate brownie when it shoots even further through the roof. Um, very, very interesting uh, how, how, how your mind plays tricks, if you like, on your stomach and convinces you to take something. What about like, because you also talked about now, you talked a bit about like the, the labeling and how that makes people take up food. And I was thinking like, can you share some of these sustainability initiatives? Because menus have changed as you talked about the 24 principles and uh, the, i think people should go and, and read the 24 principles and then you take one principle at a time make sure they uh, 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 implement and they, they, they're based of course about creating a more healthy and sustainable uh, uh, with a, what you call source of food for people and the right for food but there's also the whole planet in it what, what do you do to to take care of the the planet at the same time as you're producing food we obviously follow the menus of change form the central pillar of what we do. So uh, we always say there's three sustainabilities that we have to hit. So there's financial, because we wouldn't be here otherwise. Uh, there's environmental, so looking after the world and then looking after people. And that extends into nutrition, so sort of social sustainability. 
Uh, in terms of sort of your environmental sustainability, we're looking at things like, as we've touched on, less less red meat. Um, looking at how our buildings run. So uh, we're doing lots of fun things with buildings at the moment. So we're trying to create a dashboard where someone from out the outside world can look in at one of our buildings, which we're having metered down to the plug socket and go, oh my goodness, how much are they spending on their ovens today? And we will tell you what ovens connected and what what menus running currently and how much they're selling. So it's sort of like a live a live catering outlet displaying what it what it uses. And we found um, that data has been really fascinating because it's not the things that you think you're spending money on. Uh, once you get down to in monitoring individual appliances, so beer chillers. Absolute, they were the second worst item in the building uh, with something like 20% of the energy consumption after the ovens. Uh, you'd never have put our two little beer chillers as bad as I mean, we've got. Uh, I think that the building in question has four 20 grid rationale combi ovens. Those four ovens are similar to two beer chillers. Don't understand how it works. And these are this is we had to recheck and recheck and recheck. So again, as a university, we're really keen to share um, our expertise and spread it out uh, and challenging manufacturers on like, how much does this appliance actually um, cost to run? And then we are plugging it into a building where we monitor it forever. Uh, so we've got the sort of power side and um, that, that building in question, we've managed, I think we've managed to get to a B energy rating because we have to fill out, we have to do building EPCs. It's just fascinating, like the the energy side. But then back into food, we um, a lot of it's about those small steps, taking those small steps forward. So recently, we appointed a new green grocer, and we were, like we want to move towards uh, leaf certification as our minimum standard for fruit and veg because we want the world to do better. Our own farms are certified to leaf. Um, and it was a bit of a shock to all our green grocers that we wanted to improve, that we weren't just talking about price. And we're like, no, price is important, but we also want to do do the right thing for the environment. And as a university working around sustainability, we, we, we want to do that. Um, I think our boldest thing has been getting uh, Cisco to print the climate stripes, uh, which are a series of bars which show how the world's temperature is warming up and trying to highlight the need for people to make changes uh, on the side of one of their lorries. So there's a very pretty uh, brakes lorry trundling around the country. That's fully electric, of course, um, showcasing uh, the climate stripes um, with a link, which is showyourstripes.info. And it, you can look at different regions and how the temperature's changing, but it was developed by an academic at Reading trying to explain to people why we needed to change. So that feeds them back into our food, which is, okay, so how are we going to shift thousands of people's diets successfully? Like we could go vegan tomorrow, but no one would want to probably eat with us. Uh, so then we're like, what, what is the most successful strategy? Which goes back to this plant forward one, which is don't take stuff away from people, obviously, is start pushing them in the direction that we would like to go in and by far we I think it's safe to say we having a bigger impact on our carbon emissions by following the plant forward approach rather than trying to convince everyone to be vegan or doing meat free Mondays um, say with meat free Mondays we trialed it and our students were very much against it so that's when we we, we looked and went plant forward let's reduce the meat let's use meat as a topper let's rethink the plate which goes back to the menus of change principles is like for example you don't need potatoes at every meal um, you don't necessarily need um, meat at every meal but we do need like really good it still needs to be a really good plate of food that's really enjoyable and if it happens to be vegan great if it ha happens to be vegetarian that's good as well um, but it's not the end of the world if we have a little bit of meat on the plate. Uh, so maybe taking a bit more of a holistic approach because uh, we know we have a group of students that are happily vegan and we look after them well, but we can't. Yes, how do you convince the other 90% to change? And student diets, so we believe the impact that we have on the student diets now will last a lifetime. So let's... It's, I suppose it goes back to the fish and chip shop, doesn't it, outside the school gates. Like if you change, if you're 
students are walking off your campus to go and buy what you won't give them, then are you being successful? Probably not. So it's trying to find the right approach where you can keep them on campus, keep them happy and make the improvements that you need to both nutrition and um, say going plant forward. And that's the sort of million dollar question, I think, under, underneath the hood is how do you manage that? Because, for example, you can walk off campus and there's a Greg's right on the doorstep. There's a, lots of shops, there's burger shops. So like, how, how, do you, how do you make that work? And that's the hard bit. Like, We can make a healthy menu tomorrow. But how making a healthy menu that everyone wants to eat, that's really tricky. So taking into account like the 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 that you know delivering food on on campus is a complex beast and what you are doing is, seemed like quite unique and progressive I definitely haven't seen anything like it myself before the first time I I talked with you and well prior to that went to your website and saw a menu of change which I know really well and was very surprised to see even you know a food operator looking into this. But how, how are things going to change in general, you think, in the market as we go forward? Because I guess that the customer, the students, are setting higher demands than we know today. Absolutely. Um, we always joke that our students uh, forget after a year. It's a really convenient system or complete, complete nightmare uh, is that you, uh, most students are here for three years and then um, leave. So uh, you, they forget what you've improved on and just assume what you're what you've already improved is the, is the basic standard and they expect you to improve. So they expect high standards ever, ever higher. Uh, I think we, we are looking at, for example, at the moment, we're making a large, a large investment into our technology because we realise that technology has a big part to play in the future. That we don't want to waste food, for example. So how can technology help us more accurately predict how much food we need to uh, produce? We have six and a half thousand recipes that are in regular use uh so how can we manage those recipes better how do we capture where things aren't quite going right in terms of students how do we publish menus to thousands of students every single day that aren't the same there's um it's taken us probably about five years to answer a lot of those questions and hopefully very soon we'll we're just in the process of awarding a contract to a company that will be able to work with us to do this. Um, but it's, as you point touched on earlier, staff are expensive. No one wants to pay more than everyone wants to pay the least for food, but everyone wants it to be ethical uh, and sustainable. So we have to operate as efficiently as possible and the only way we can probably do that is use it better using technology. A lot of our existing IT didn't. Well, I think iPhones were barely invented when it was introduced. So again, we're looking at things like how can AI, how can data, big data, how can all these really interesting things come together and tell us, like, or guide us, like what we need to order tomorrow, or make a quick substitution on a menu item because there's a crazy man outside with a pallet of celeriac. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, technology is a big part of the way forward uh, and our students want to eat at every time of the day as well. So for example, if we go and have a look at the US, which is a really fascinating market for higher ed, uh, they have, for example, Grubhub, which you are just eat, I think, in the UK, have uh, robots delivering food around campus because it's cheaper than making someone walk. Uh, so that's probably a good thing. There's uh, things like Picnic, who have the self-topping pizza machine. You can see a lot of this tech uh, coming into environments like universities where you have a large, large residential population that want food all day, every day, day in, day out. So I think it's uh, a question of uh, embracing that tech as it comes in. So for us, it's been building a new platform for us to operate on. Uh, that's expandable and hopefully can be changed in the future and be bits added on. We don't know what's going to happen next. COVID taught us that our technology fell quite short of what we needed it to do. Uh, we're doing a lot of manual manual processing. Um, so yeah, it's it's very exciting.
It's very interesting also you talk about data points and actually knowing when to have food available and also that almost like you are going from almost being a catering business to a restaurant that's like open 24-7 and people almost want or the customer, the student has this expectation of being served and I guess it's the whole journey we've all been through with the smartphone where we are the center of the world and push of a button we can get what we want and that's part of the uh, the customer experience for the University of Reading as well to, to be able to provide that kind of service I guess. Yeah absolutely I mean I think I alluded to the fact that we've gone from not being 365 days to being 365 days and we sort of let that genie out of the out of the lamp and that's not going back in now. People are like, no, we want lunch on Christmas Day. Thank you very much, because we're living in halls on campus. Like, Fine, we can give you lunch on Christmas Day for the same price as we normally do. Uh, so we have our staff wearing tinsel and uh, cooking Christmas lunch. And then I think the next step is, so I think we, we generally don't cook between 1 a.m. and 6 a.m. And you're like, that's becoming less you can tell that's the final frontier for our students is they're like well i'm on a meal plan and i want a burger at three in the morning why can't i have it um so yeah i think technology is going to have to play a part in how do we give our students what they want when they want how they want um so yeah no maybe maybe robots are coming to our campus so actually something I should have asked you in the beginning, Mel, or just thinking, as you say, availability, how large is your team actually to be able to provide, you know, on, on a day-to-day basis? Because people think how this is, sounds like a very complex operation with bars, you know, buffets, uh, events catering, you have it all in a way, and then you have logistics as well on top of it. How large is this team that's actually delivering this service? We, and uh, myself, we, I have about 100 full-time staff supported by about 400 students um, who are doing lots of different roles uh, from, say, kitchen portering to serving our students. Um, but our catering is so large, it's then we have several other parts of the university also. So I've got a colleague looking after, say, cafes and our hospitality and conferencing services, another colleague looking after hotel services. Um, so my, my team, for example, interacts with other parts of the university to provide sort of kitchens and chefs for forward, um, for forward serving. But I think the, with a campus of 17,000 students, 5,000 staff, several thousand staff with other companies, it's the size of a small town. Uh, so it's, it's, it is vast, um, but yeah, maybe a theme park is the best analogy of a university campus. Uh, I never think, I think if you swap le- rides for lecture theatres, you sort, sort, sort of have, have the right thing, hotels for halls of residence. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, they're very unique. Um, I noticed one of our wholesalers, a uh, big multinational wholesaler, said they counted higher education as its own sector they said they don't lump it into public sector because it's not really they felt it wasn't really like anything else it sort of wasn't really like what was happening on the high street it was somewhere in the middle um you may have high street brands running as franchises or part of the campus ecosystem but you may not um so yeah very very, very complicated but then very seasonal as well so we have 31 weeks that we're very busy and then 21 weeks where we're relatively quiet with some conference business coming through and some students that stay stay during vacation times. Yeah, and I just thought it was really interesting to get that down as well because I, I, I thought about it when you were talking in the beginning and I got a bit uh, fascinated about the whole uh, menus for change because, again, on top of that, you then implement it in that complex system with so many people and so many part-time people, you have actually got menus of change working but what what on this journey, or especially the last couple of years, you know, in a post pandemic world, has been you know your biggest learning as the leader of a, an organization like this? Like, what what take do you take away? Well, we decided life wasn't complicated enough already, so we uh, joined another group uh, called Menus Change University Research Collaborative, 
And they're a fascinating group where they do research on campuses. Um, so this is where we're working in partnership with our academics. So that's probably been the biggest learning curve from me and my team. So we're like, now we're going to conduct research to uh, the same level that our academic colleagues expect. So you have the academic world colliding with catering, um, which is... a uh, it's taught our academics a lot and taught our catering staff a lot, in both in good ways. Um, so for me as a leader, that's been really enlightening, understanding how academics make sure their data is like, stands up to peer review, uh, and it's taught our team a lot. As in, you can't just change you can't just change that thing because you're going to mess up someone's five year study. Uh, and equally, our academics have had to realise that life isn't. But they may research something, uh, so they come up with a great way to solve world hunger. Uh, and they put it into a dining room to see if it has any legs and it's just completely trashed. And they're like, oh, and you're like, well, you could have come and talked to us and we might have been able to give you a few pointers because we know that wouldn't work. And why don't you know? Why wouldn't it work? And it's like, well, because we do this every day. Uh, so I think that, that, that sort of collaborative working with other universities as well as our academics. Uh, as bizarre as it sounds to outsiders, didn't used to happen. Uh, the uh, university is vast, so you're, by, as a department, we never really needed to talk to our colleagues that research food, but we've learnt a lot from them and come out as better people. Is there anything you are super excited about right now in the uh, on your journey? Uh, super excited. Definitely growing more food. So we are... Um, in the early stages of hopefully starting to grow more salads on campus, uh, hopefully at a scale that can be self-sufficient. Uh, I think it will take several years, so that's very exciting because I've always fancied hydroponics. Uh, and then I think it's also um, just as our menus develop. So we, we've been very lucky. We're growing the number of students we're feeding regularly. So our fully catered students are growing quite quickly. So we're ex- so. Our our revenue increased by about a million last year and we expect that to happen again the coming year and all of that we work generally at cost with our students um that that additional revenue gives us so much more freedom to do so many more exciting things and provide an even better experience for students um i'm one of those people that gets super excited when you go to a trade show you're like i want that i want that i want that i want that and then you get back and go i can't actually afford any of it um But um, I think it's things like sushi. There's so many exciting things. Like I'm like, why can't they have sushi on campus? Um, bakery. Um, the uh, ask my suppliers are remarkably tolerant of me. I, I I asked one last week for the most beautiful pizza oven that they sold because uh, I said I want, I've got this vision of a beautiful pizza oven in the middle of a catering outlet. What do you have? And they just roll their eyes and go away. But they've come back with lots of good suggestions. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I think the what life life excites me. I think it's a fascinating industry and a really great place to be. And whilst uh, not everything we do is for everyone, for another university, we're always very open about what we're doing and happy to share. Um, so, and hopefully others become inspired because ultimately we became inspired by others, um, both in the UK other restaurants and uh, other universities globally yeah and i think definitely it's not you don't have to be a university to be inspired by this you can just be in food in principle in my view food and drinks then there's definitely something to learn from from your journeys and for others journeys as well um what would you be your top advice because some of the listeners i'm quite sure have googled menus of change and then they land there and they think wow, where do I start? What would your top advice be to people that says, oh, I want to go on this journey as well. I want to work with these principles to improve my offering and my, my organization and business in the end. I think you, the first thing you do is choose to do it. Um, so if you're looking at it, you're possibly already on the journey. And then just picking one thing. So uh, it depends. It doesn't need to be the hardest. It could be, there's what there's principles that we haven't really gone for yet so there's ones around buildings which we have been light on the touch uh, but for example uh, there's one about reducing potatoes maybe that's the right thing for your for your operation or reducing red meat um, or moving nuts and legumes to the center of the plate I think it's just taking one and just having a think about it and talking to your team and 
saying, what, what can we do on this? And as soon as you start with one and more, you, you just start doing more and more. But it's a, it's a process of continual improvement, which I think sometimes we're very bad at um, understanding is there's no, there's not really an end to it. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a long journey and a journey you can be on for life. And it doesn't, it's not geared up in a way, it's not like you reach this point and you get a gold star. It's, it's very broad, it's very open. They're open to interpretation, that's good as well. Like one university, will be, for example, goes one way and another goes the other and they completely disagree with each other. But they're both following the same principles. Uh, so I think it's just going, taking a little bit first and trying it out, see if it works. Uh, but involving lots of people and just talking about it. So the principles are backed with larger pieces of text, uh, which you can find on the Menus of Change website. So they're long, longer descriptions that explain what's going on. And there's another document buried on their website, which was uh, from universities. And it was around, um, for example, they said reduce red meat. And it was like, what strategies have been successful for you as a food service operator? And they've lift, listed those and said, what are the challenges? What would you like to do? What are the barriers? And there's loads of really interesting uh, comments and feedback from multiple universities saying about how they've tackled each principle. And the vast majority of that feedback is relevant for everyone. Um, it's, it's helpful. Uh, students at the end of the day are just con they're just another group of consumers they they venture onto the high street and eat eat with most people um, so yeah I definitely spend some time having a look around the websites and I think the most important thing is the, the these are developed by the Culinary Institute of America who are at heart chefs and people that love food so they have the practical knowledge and expertise um, backing them and that's what the whole menus of change system is based mm. on it's about bringing academics and culinary individuals together and trying to improve the world and both environmentally and socially for everyone so. yeah and i think that was really really important the last thing you said because that is like it's practical uh you, know, you can uh, you can actually put it to use it's not just theory it's actually practical examples there you can go in and find what is the uh, the one question, Matt? You wished I've asked you, and I didn't. And what would the question be, and what would you answer? Why are you still doing your job? <laughs> <laughs> so why are you still doing your job, Matt? That's a really good uh, one. Because <laughs> I never know when to leave. Uh, no, I mean it's it's a it's a really fascinating. I would say to anyone listening to your podcast is never dismiss uh, universities as places to work. They're not necessarily at the top of people people are like oh i've got a, i work in hospitality let's go and work in a university uh, but there's so many um fascinating roles and jobs and things going on in them that i always say go go and have a peek uh jobs.ac.uk is the best place for acad for university jobs um but yeah no i think that's yeah i i love it i it's very rewarding working with students um so yeah my question would be why why are you still doing it it's because it's a great place to work and um, yeah, hopefully hopefully change people's minds. So it's a different set of pressures. Uh, we have things like the National Student Survey, um, which is equivalent to having a, a group of angry shareholders, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, the grass is never green on the other side, I always say. But that was a good, that was a good one and a good shout out there because there is a definitely missed opportunity uh, because often, as you say, it's actually just, it's, it's a little city and that's bigger than most food operations uh, I know about. So if people want to learn more about what you guys are doing and maybe connect with you because I think this is super fascinating, I want to learn more, can I, can I reach out to, to Matt? Is that possible? Yeah, absolutely. They can use LinkedIn or they can go and visit all our websites. So we have um, www.givingfoodmorethought.com is one of our landing pages um, about the academic and um, food side coming together. Then there's obviously all the websites, but yes, by all means, they're welcome to. Unless they're trying to sell me something that's highly processed, in which case the answer is no. <laughs> Good, good, good. I will send you and the team at the uh, University of Reading uh, the power and energy you need to continue the journey on menus of change and all the other good work you're doing. And uh, thank you so much for coming on the show, sharing your insights, uh, wisdom and uh, knowledge. 
Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. I really appreciate that you're listening in. So, if you enjoyed today's conversation, please share with others, rate, or give a review, or subscribe to one of our channels. Which all can be done via the website hospitalitymavericks.com. I believe that reading the right books is the key to become a better leader. So I've helped you with a curated list of some of the best books to improve yourself, others, and the organization. Find them on hospitalitymavericks.com. A big thank you to Biz Simply for supporting us, bringing great insights, strategies, and tools to help leaders to become better every day. Check them out at bitsimply.com or on their socials at bitsimply or bitsimply HQ. You can also email them directly at podcast at bitsimply.com. Thank you to Fina Charlson, who is the show producer from the podcast Collective. If you have any ideas and feedback for the show or other thoughts, reach out to me via LinkedIn or via my email, michael at hospitalitymavericks.com. I'm Michael Tinkser, and you've been listening to the Hospitality Maverick podcast show. Be Maverick. <laughs>